Congressman Louis Gohmert joins us now. How are you, Louis? Well, a little depressed right now. Thank you, Derek. I want to talk to you about a lot of things, but first of all, tell us why you're depressed right now. <laughs> well, it's a great convergence of a lot of problems. Uh, for one, um, and it's not like it wasn't expected. I mean, back in September, I was begging uh, our, rep- our Republican representatives not to put off a fight over the wall. That, And as I told our, our all the Republicans in our conference, uh, look, this will be my 14th December here. And so far, I believe we've had 13 where people said, let's put that off and fight over that in December. And certainly each of the elections, yeah, let's wait and fight over that after the election. Why are Republicans we so never reluctant? never fight over it after the election. It has never happened since I've been here. Why are Republicans so reluctant to fight before an election for things that they at least campaign saying they believe in, like the wall? Well, two, two big reasons, Derek. One is that uh, it's always easier to put off fighting till tomorrow what you don't want to fight about today. And the other is the constant uh, badgering over being a team player, not rocking the boat. Uh, nobody, yeah, I mean, come on, nobody wants to be a renegade, really. You know, I guess there are a few, but m- most Republicans, we don't want to be, you know, the, the outcast. We don't want to be the one stinking up the well, place. Plus, leadership will punish you. Yeah, and well, of course there is that, and that's why um, I'm not a committee chairman. But uh, you know, th- that's the thing we we've heard over and over. In my my first week in orientation, the most commonly used phrase was, "The best thing you can do for your country is get reelected." <laughs> and at first time it was said, I was going, "Well, that's kind of strange." And then each time after that, it really offended me. Because sometimes you just have to take a stand right. and not worry about re-election, worry about the country and what uh, is right for the country. Well, how is I it? Mean, you could end up like Sam Houston. I mean, he took a stand against secession and and fighting over slavery, and he was ostracized. I mean, the guy we wouldn't have a Texas, but for Sam Houston, and uh, as I understand, he didn't die with a lot of friends. But sometimes doing the right thing is more important. How is it that the Congress can't find $5 billion? You spend t- more than twice that per day our federal government does. That's got well, to- the Democrats obviously don't want it for two reasons. Number one, uh, they've got a lot of voters that are coming across the border illegally that they're hoping uh, will will be able to vote uh, illegally or legally. They don't care. Uh, but the other thing is they know, and Derek, it reminds me a little bit of George H.W. Bush's uh, promise, you know, no new taxes, right. read my lips. Uh, the promise of the wall by Donald Trump, who I'm a big fan of, but he, uh, that promise of his for the wall was the biggest promise that was made. And they, I think the Democratic leaders, I don't know if everybody does, but the Democratic leaders sense that the promise for building the wall is up there on a parallel with read my lips, no new taxes. And so they have fought against funding the wall. Never mind that they've been for the wall before they were against it. Mm -hmm. Never mind that they have uh, um, authorized money expenditures before for a wall, for fence, for all these things, for virtual wall. Now they're against it because they know if they can keep uh, from from appropriating money for a wall, then the president's odds of winning the next election are are extremely slim. I hadn't thought of it in the terms. Oh yeah, no, I hadn't. I hadn't thought of it in terms of the read my lips and the Democrats. Once Bush threw that gauntlet down, it became their mission in life to make sure that they raise taxes. And I think that's where we are on the wall. It's their mission to keep him from being able to say, "I kept my biggest promise," which they were rightly concerned would get him reelected. Louis, let me ask you, though, because I I personally am, and I had Ann Coulter on yesterday, and she's very disappointed, but are you surprised at the ease with which Donald Trump seems to have allowed this issue to be kicked past the next Congress? Well, he wants to work with people over here on the Hill, and he's just not used to, in the private sector, having people that are reputedly on his side, uh, 
conspiring to keep him from getting what he promised. Uh, and that's that's what we've seen. Republican leaders, elected leaders, I use that term loosely, but they're elected. Uh, they have really, they were not for a wall before he got elected. As uh, Paul Ryan, very decent, honorable person, he was saying before the uh, the election, we didn't really need a wall. And if you recall, just a few weeks before the election, uh, we were told by Paul, by our elected leaders, that, uh, gee, the only way that we can keep the House uh, majority is just all of us start running against the president. Fortunately, we had enough people, one after another, on the call that pushed back so hard they backed off of that. But uh, they've never really been in favor of the wall. And, you know, in private, in the private sector, Trump knew if somebody that was on his side undermined him, uh, there'd be hell to pay. They, right. He was apparently not uh, shy of suing people that didn't keep their promises and so he's not used to being in a government setting, even two years later, where people that are uh, supposedly on his side are not trying to help him as they say they are. Well, that first business. medical bill, the health care bill, I mean, that was going to, re- they told him it was going to repeal Obamacare. And all it, the biggest thing it did was give more power to health and human services. Now, eventually, once we stopped that one, the Freedom Caucus did, then we got a bill that was better. But that first one, I mean, he he was convinced. He was believing McConnell and Ryan and all these folks say, oh, yeah, this is going to repeal it. No, it didn't repeal anything. Well, that's the difference between the private sector and the public sector. In the private sector, if you're trying to work with somebody and it doesn't, nothing happens, neither one of you make any money. That's right. But in, when it's power, it's kind of a zero-sum game. And, I, and there I, I are still... people in power in the Republican Party that do not want him to succeed and, uh, heck, there are probably people at the Weekly Standard, now that it's failed, that would like to see the pro- president go down before they do. But, but uh, I'm not seeing the president fight very hard on this. Mentioning it in tweets and, and, and mm-hmm. photo ops is one thing, but he's not out there going to states where vulnerable members of Congress are, that you know he's going to put the pressure to them, giving speeches, selling the American people on it, keeping it at the top issue. He... Is there blame? Do you put blame on the president at all? Uh, well, he could take the hard stand that he said he was going to, and we're just going to have a shutdown until we finally get some money in here. The trouble is neither uh, McCarthy, even though he he apparently filed a bill uh, after Andy Biggs did, and, and Brad Byrne has a great bill that we could have brought up, that would amend the budget resolution so that funding for the wall could be done in reconciliation, which you know means the Senate can do it with 50 votes. I say 50 because if there's a tie, right. the vice president would surely, surely yes. uh, vote to back up the president. And yet uh, we heard from Cornyn, and apparently McConnell's taken the position that, uh, gee, uh, they are not doing a reconciliation to fund the wall. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, the the president is up against apparently all Republican leaders in the House and Senate, elected leaders that is in the House and Senate, and uh, uh, I don't know what. Uh, I'm a big proponent of getting your pets spayed and neutered, but I've never seen grown men in leadership positions neuter themselves like we're seeing right now. Well, see, they don't see it that way. What they see is that uh, President Trump, you know, gets most of the attention and uh, if he's not around then it'll be back to them being in the spotlight more than him so i i don't know it's it's really they the the people that are at the top elected positions in the house and the senate both don't understand that by neutering this president and preventing him from getting reelected in two years they will lose the majority in the Senate. They will. They're not going to keep the majority 
when we when we lose the presidency. Well, it doesn't seem so like Republicans what know what to do in the majority. You're not going to win back the majority in the House if the president goes down. They does, don't get that. It doesn't seem like Republicans know are very good at being in the majority. They're very good at being in the minority. Louis, I wanted to, I had you on because I want to get into this prison reform business oh, yes, right. that everybody's you know in the media is getting excited by. There the Democrats. Go. Well, we'll make some prisoners happy. That's for sure. Right. I, I suspected you might have some problems with this as I do that the idea that these are mostly nonviolent drug offenders like it's just your sweet neighborhood heroin well, dealer well, who it, and let me say Derek I, I I've never been more honored than when Edwin Meese called me about 10 years ago or so and and said I would like to work with you on doing criminal justice reform uh, but Derek the reforms we were talking about were things I wholeheartedly support. I want a criminal justice reform. But we were talking about things about like uh, requiring intent to be proved before you could put somebody in, in prison uh, for a federal crime. Uh, we were talking about how many people you know, are put in prison for violating a regulation that no elected official has ever had any say whatsoever on. We passed, uh, they say, may, nobody knows for sure, maybe 5,000 criminal laws in the federal government, and we're not supposed to have that much criminal jurisdiction. It's normally back in the states, but I know from having uh, been a pros- state prosecutor, a felony judge back in Texas, a chief justice, and and having been appointed on some criminal cases uh, in federal court, that uh, you know most of the people that go to prison in federal court, especially on drug charges, these are not normally your small players. Right. But if they squeal on somebody above them, prosecutors, uh, U.S. attorneys will say, okay, you give us dirt on the big guy above you. And we won't bring out the fact that you had a gun at at this crime scene, right. or we won't we won't uh, charge you. We'll drop charges, these other twelve charges, and you'll only plead to one. And and so then these folks are taking advantage, saying, "Ah, eh, you know, it's not that serious." But if you look at the the offenses that are going to be eligible for getting their time cut, and, and and in fairness, I am prejudiced because I've been a judge that sat up late at night reading over pre-sentence investigation reports and and sat there and listened to every word, reviewed all of the evidence on sentencing, and then made a determination, sometimes on my own, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, whether I would uh, go along with a, with a plea recommendation. But I agonized over those sentences. And, you know, then somebody's coming in years later going, you know what, we don't know what you knew when you sentenced these people but and we really don't know the specific cases of all these thousands we're going to cut loose but even though we don't know what you knew we're smarter than you so we're just going to cut tens of thousands of people loose early and if you look you know i know they're saying no no this won't affect uh, really bad criminals right but if you look um 18 usc 2422 uh those people will be eligible for uh time cuts and getting out early and that those are those charged with uh, engaging a coercion or enticement to engage in prostitution or so other, other sexual activities you know including with minors uh we're talking all there are 1466 of those offenders that'll be eligible for early well, release that's the thing about this this has been debated and argued up on capitol hill behind the scenes and now suddenly as this congress comes to an end it becomes an imperative and we have to act now. It hasn't really been sold to the American public. There is no groundswell in the American I'm told population. The biggest for this. reason for passing it now is because uh, Jared needs a big win. So, um, you know, God bless him. He's working hard, he's trying to help out. But from people that have talked to him about this, he's very sincere and honorable and genuine. Uh, and they've pointed out some of these things, but then he goes and talks to folks who say, "No, no, it, it won't do that." We, you know, and and Ted Cruz did get an amendment to it that will cut out some of the the violent people that would be eligible. But here's uh, another relating to if, if you're charged with bank robbery involving risk of uh, violence or death, 
There are 5,934 offenders that will be eligible for time cuts under this bill. If you're charged with assaulting, resisting, impeding certain officers and employees, uh, 372 more offenders will be eligible for early release. Uh, those relating to violent assault, uh, there's 657 who will be eligible under that. Um, so, I mean, this this is serious stuff. And and I go back historically. We saw this in Texas when uh, Texas loosened up criminal laws to you know so that we would help out these offenders and and surely this would help cut recidivism. And I, I want to cut recidivism, and the best way to do that from the studies I've seen is to allow criminal, uh, criminal uh, inmates to have access to Christian groups that come in and mentor. But And one of the big reasons, they don't just help you and visit with you and, and work with you while you're in prison. They are are with you, kind of like right. AA. They're sponsors. They help you out afterwards. Well, you but, can't uh, have that, Louie. Yeah, I that's, know, I know, because they're Christian. That's a fact. That's How does that empower government, which seems to be the uh, question everybody asks? Louie, I could talk to you all day, but the yeah. clock well, won't. Well, let me just say that when you start doing these early releases, then you it may take two years, but you will see crime rates start to go up, and then they'll go up and up, and then people will be outraged. And then they will we'll crack back down like we did, uh, you know, in prior decades. And then the crime rate goes down. And when the crime rates go down far enough, people say, you know, let's start letting these people out. And then the crime rate goes up. It's a cycle. But we're at a very, very, very precarious time in our history. And this is not the time to be cutting them loose. We need criminal justice reform, but not cutting people loose that prosecutors and judges have agonized to reach the right sentence on. No, you're right. And we could do this piecemeal. We could address cases on a much smaller scale, but these big ones always have massive, as they say, unintended consequences, although I suspect they're not all that unintended. Louis Gohmert, Congressman, Texas 1st District, thank you for coming on, and Merry Christmas to you. Thank you for caring. Yep, thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you.